Okay. So, uh, well, I need to stand. Here's a C1 with EMG pickets. So here's how I, I started playing bass. I, uh, I was like 15 years old, and I would, uh, I, was right, I actually met these guys, John and Armando, uh, I think they were a couple, and I met them on a bus, trying to bus out to uh, Forest Grove to uh, visit a girl that was, uh, okay, Lori McCammon. Uh, girls who uh, were used to farm animal smells kind of like me. I met her in a, when I was playing at a, a dance at some Catholic school uh, with a band called Skyclad with Chris Craig and uh, Jeff Knapp and Dave Lindsay. Anyway, uh, I went out to this house to jam and it was way out in the country. And that's when Hillsborough was all country. And uh, we took some acid, and, uh, which I did a lot then. And uh, I took my guitar, my Les Paul coffee, and uh, uh, this guy named Tom Bulma picked me up. I used Lawrence Hannon's amp. <laughs> He didn't know it. It was a Fender Basin. But anyway, went out there and uh, I sat around and didn't get to play much. And John was a bass player and Armando was a drummer. So John said he had a Rickenbacker, a white one, really nice. You want to play bass? So I thought, sure, I'll try it. And, uh, I played for about a half hour while he was off doing something. That hands working is much better. And so he said, okay, great. So I went there the next week and he let me use his bass again and I liked it. And the third week he said, I'm not gonna be here next week. Do you wanna play bass all night? And if you do, I'll leave my bass at this house. And amp. So I uh, played through some amp SCT thing. And uh, this is the early 70s when everything was big. So uh, I realized right then that if I played bass, I could play all night long. And so took more acid. And I played all night and like till like the next morning. And I played bass, and all the other guitar players play guitar. It's great. I said, oh, I got to do this. So I uh, kind of hijacked Malcolm Smith's bass and brought that out the next week and a guitar. And uh, the Rick and Michael was much nicer. <laughs> so uh, I just started playing bass then. And, uh... I still like playing guitar, but uh, bass uh, kind of fits me. It's like drums, but you, uh, you play it on a, a guitar. <laughs> so I just took that and uh, ran with it, and that's how I started playing bass. In Wild Dogs, though, since I was playing guitar, in the Ravers, I came, I, uh, and Danny was a bass player of Wild Dogs. I, I played bass with a band with Mick Land Mike Landauer and uh, Mick Zane from Alice, Pete Holmes and uh, Jeff Horton, and I played bass. I played my 63 Fender jazz bass with a cut off horn. But uh, for when we started Wild Dogs, I brought a guitar because that's what I would usually play. And uh, it was a 1977 or 78 Iceman pre-production model that I got from uh, Kevin Gron. I traded him a Thunder Thunderbird bass, an all-black one that was owned by Julian Raymond, 
from the band movie star in Hell and Jet. And uh, he's now a, like a hit producer and, uh, for Hollywood Records. And, uh, I did like you know a hundred of gigs with that guitar, and uh, Jay Reynolds was living here, and <laughs> we were messing around, uh, blowing up speakers actually with my some amp I had, and uh, he stepped on the cord and broke the jack plate off the jack off, uh, the jack off, and so I fixed that. But uh, I ended up trading that guitar for a. A 1973 Honda 500 four-stroke, four, four to one, four cylinder, a chopper. Speaking of Jan, Megadeth. And uh, I rode that thing till the wheels were square, man. <laughs> I ended up getting rid of a set of my books. I miss that guitar. That's why I bought an Iceman. But the Iceman I have now has a Floyd Rose and an Ivan's Rose. And uh, it's a signature model from the guy in Dragon Force. Uh, Scott? Something? I don't know, but it's really great. And it does every ride is good. I got two of them. I bought another guitar this week because I'm depressed. It's a Chinese Rick, we call them Rickers, but it's a Rickerbach copy of a 4003 bass, but it's a guitar. So in about a month or more, I think it should happen. It was only 200 bucks, so it's great. But that's how I started playing bass and uh, I never looked back, but you know, Wild Dog Danny was a superb bass player. Both of those guys, Jeff and Danny, were. Uh, I never did the cover band circuit. Those guys were doing it early. Danny was in a band called Jet at age like 13, playing all over at schools. Yeah, City Town Flame, that was a good song by Police Patrol. If you could do that, you're pretty good. Chris Craig to do it. I went to school at Jesuit with him, and uh, then he moved to San Francisco and uh, started a, a recording studio. I think he had something to do with Wally Hyder, and he was a, a Blister Cult fan, and uh, I think he hooked it with Sandy Perlman. Sandy Perlman produced Blister Cult, and I met him once when uh, me and Buka, my mom, moved down to California. Well, we were on tour with Hardline, Dean's band. Dean and Neil Sean. Uh, and so I went to a studio to go see Mike Varney, the same place that Joe Sanchez recorded Searching for the Alien. And uh, Sandy Furman was there listening to tapes. He looked just like the guy in Cracked Magazine, you know, uh, great work shirt, hat, and jeans. There was another guy there, Joelli, and his dad was in The Rascals. That's pretty cool. And, uh, and we hung out there for a while and saw how the record producer uh, scrutinized the tape. Don't send the picture, just send the music. Because I saw Varney just look at a picture, toss the tape without even listening to it. So that's with with Wild Dog. We sent an S and M picture and a Bondi's picture of these guys in like PVC suits, <laughs> and that's it. No band picture because we were too ugly, <laughs> and uh, we thought the music was more important. Yeah.
numbers had poodle had to do so. So, so anyway, I had learned a lot that night. Then we went, me and Booker went back to the executive suites. The pool was open 24 hours, and we went swimming. Got and had breakfast. That was a long trip. We uh, couldn't find a hotel the, the night before, so we drove down to Sacramento and missed the gig. We couldn't hook up with these. There was no cell phones back then, 1992. And um, we drove all the way back across the Golden Gate up north. The, the next good night, the gig was at the Marin Center, Marin County Center. And uh, <laughs> we drove almost all the way to Santa Rosa and found a hotel with some these sailors that were standing outside. They looked like they were going to leave. I, didn't, I walked in and no rooms. They were sold out. And this guy said, hey, we're leaving our room. You can have it. Huh? Okay, so I told the guy in the in the office of the hotel, I said, here's $50. These guys are going to give us their room. He said, well, we can't do that. I said, are you sure? I'm not going to tell anybody. We're just going to take over the room so we can sleep, so we don't have to sleep in the car. It'll be boiling. And so we did. And uh, the pool was open in the morning. We went over that too. And uh, that was Hardline, Mr. Big, and the Electric Boys. And uh, you know, I saw the the crew of Hardline, and the road manager said, "Hey, say the executive suite." Dean said, "You can stay here." So it was like thirty bucks for a totally deluxe room. Because they got the, the tour deal, and uh, that was our story of uh, falling hardline on a tour to California. This is a Schecter C1. I bought from Dave Hathaway, my good friend and drummer, as you know, and uh, I put EMT pickups on it. It's a great guitar, but there's my story for tonight, and uh, I'm sick to it. I'm tired. I can hardly. Uh, the doctor say I got to sleep, you know, sitting up in bed, which is so hard because I sleep on my stomach. That's about the only thing hard in bed. Ugh, I hate these meds. So. I'd boil rock forever. Thank you, usmetal.com. I'll see you later. Good night.